Okay. So, today is the day that I'm going to give everybody plus five. Okay. That doesn't mean nobody shows up next week. We still have two <laughs> lectures. All right. We started immuno assays last time, so we'll continue today, but just in order to continue um, with some knowledge refreshed in your minds, let's go back and answer a few questions. What's the main principle behind immuno assays? Try to remember without looking at your notes. See what's stuck in your head, if anything at all. Oh dear. <laughs> Yes, save the day. Go ahead. Antibodies interacting with antigen, and you need some form of indication that there has been an indicate uh, reaction. So you have this enzyme that you can use, or you can link a radioactive material, or you can link an enzyme, or you can just link a color. But most cases, you link an enzyme to an antibody or an antigen, and then that enzyme, uh, you put a substrate, it gives you a product that measures absorbance, can measure absorbance of. So that's briefly the principle of immunoassays. What are some applications we talked about last time? In which cases we would tend to use immunoassays? Michelle. So a patho pathogenic bacteria is one thing you would use uh, amino acids to detect, but usually a protein on the surface of the bacteria. Proteins in terms of their allergens. Allergen labeling? Yeah, for allergen labeling, yeah, that would be a protein. You want to make sure that you test for allergens, especially if they're produced in a place where there could be contamination. Um, GMO testing? GMO testing, yes. Toxins. So aflatoxins, for example, even pesticides, you can use immunoassays to determine those. Um, anything else we talked about last time? Meat species. Meat species was one example. If you have, we, we talked about horse meat in your beef patty, if you want to detect that. So yes, so there are obviously many applications for immunoassays. What is an epitope? a fun name, yeah. Exactly. So that's the region on your antigen that would bind <laughs> stereospecifically, very specific binding to your antibody. And these the antibodies produced in the body of an animal is basically uh, produced based on the antigen that was in the blood or exposed to them. So they would produce so many different antibodies that would be specific to certain epitopes on your antigen. What is the difference between polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies? From the name, you know, poly and mono. Friday, it's Friday. Everybody's tired, including me, but here I am. Yep. Yes, so a B cell, one type of B cell will produce one type of um, an antibody and that would be specific to one type of epitope, to one epitope. Whereas monoclonal is produced by several B cells and each would be specific to a particular region on that antigen, not necessarily one specific region. And how can we produce a polyclonal antibody? It's very simple. What would you do? Erica? Um, yeah, you get it from animal blood, but what do you do to the animal to get it? You inject them with the antigen. 
So you inject them with the antigen, it will be a foreign matter for them in the blood, then this will induce uh, production of antibodies. And these would be polyclonal in nature. Whereas monoclonal, we talked last time about producing them in vitro, so they fuse B cells, same type of B cells on cancerous cells, and they uh, proliferate, and then you would have gen you would generate a monoclonal antibody. These are very important when you're running standard ELISAs and to have standards uh, where you use a, a monoclonal um, antibody that can be labeled, you find them commercially, and it makes ELISA kits easier. Um, what's the difference between direct and indirect ELISA? Remember that was the confusing bit. Um, and yeah? Indirect ELISA requires the addition, the binding of another anti antigen or antibody to the standard system. Yes, so an indirect ELISA, you have an antibody to the antibody. Remember? And we said this is usually common because it's commercially available. You can get an antibody that you can label. Uh, outside of the assay, and it would be an antibody to the main antibody that you use for detection. So when you have an antibody to the antibody, that's an indirect ELISA. And we gave an example where sandwich ELISA can be direct or indirect. All right. So we talked about sandwich ELISA, direct and indirect, last time. So And we stopped at this slide where we wanted to move on with competitive ELISA. So competitive ELISA is usually used when your antigen is very, very small compared to a big protein, for example. So if your antigen is like a mycotoxin, it's very small in molecular weight, less than 5,000 G, or G or grams per mole, that is, or deltan, in this, in this case, um, the ELISA that you would use is competitive ELISA. So, in order to generate antibodies for a small antigen like that, you need to have a carrier system. Because small antigens like that are not, you cannot, the body cannot produce antibodies uh, against them when they're that small. So if you want to induce production of antibodies specific to these small antigen, you link them to a carrier protein. So and then when you link them to a carrier protein, then this becomes a haptin. So when you have a common protein, usually albumin protein, and you link it to your antigen and inject that into the animal body, then you can generate antibodies that will, one of them is bound to have, an, to be specific to that particular antigen. So basically it's called a haptin when it is linked to a carrier protein, and since it's very small, it would be the whole antigen will be one epitope to a particular antibody generated in the body of the animal. So because you have one, you are saved. <laughs> I, got, I gave a plus five for everybody today for coming to class. Yes. <laughs> so you didn't mess out on that. All right. Uh, trick is to remember where I was. Hmm. Where I was? Oh, we cannot use a sandwich, Eliza, I was saying, because since you have one epitope on, on the antigen, you cannot sandwich the antigen with two specific antibodies. There is no room. One antibody would hold up onto the epitope, and there will be no other epitope for another antibody to sandwich it. So therefore, it, it would only work in a competitive form. OK, so here's an example of how it can ELISA would form with a competitive uh, nature. So you have your hydrophobic surface. And then you, you can either have um, antibody format where you start with antibody or you, you, uh, you can have a hapton format where you start with the hapton here and I'll show you on the next slide how you do that. So if you start with antibodies, 
So this is your antigen that is present in the sample, let's say aflatoxin, so it's there in the sample. And then you will have also an, another antigen that has been linked to the enzyme. <coughs> so what will happen is that when you put your sample and you put uh, the um, antigen that has been previously linked to an enzyme, they will compete for binding site on the antibodies. So hence the name competitive. So they will compete. The more antigens you have in your sample, the less of the labeled antigen will bind. Okay? In this case, when you put the, when you add the substrate at the end for the color, a higher concentration of aflatoxin, say, will have higher absorption or lower absorption? Lower. Lower, lower absorption. So because it's competing with the labeled one, so the more you have of the antigen in the sample, the less labeled one will attach. So when you add the substrate, you'll have less uh, enzyme attached. So you'll have less generation of color. Okay, so that's opposite to a sandwich ELISA where the color is directly proportional to the amount of antigen in your sample. So this is a figure from your chapter, but it illustrates that you can either have uh, antibody format or a haptin format. One thing you should note is that the haptin you generate to produce antibodies in, the, in an animal should be different than the haptin you use in the assay. Okay, that's what this says here. Why is that? Why do you think is that? If you look at the diagrams in front of you, what would happen if you use the same haptin? Again, the haptin is a combination of a carrier protein with your antigen. Hmm? Would you detect the carrier protein instead of the antigen? You would detect carrier protein with, along with the antigen because the antibodies you collect from the animal would have, some of them would have antibodies for particular epitopes on the carrier protein, not just the antigen. So you want to make sure that in your ELISA assay, you use a different haptin, you get a different protein, link it with your antigen to generate a different haptin. Therefore, only the antibodies that will recognize the antigen will bind. Okay? All right, so here's an example where you, you start your layer with antibodies, and then you will have your antigen in the sample, and you have the antigen with it, or actually the haptin that has the antigen, the carrier protein, and the linked enzyme. Okay, so the haptin is carrier protein, antigen and a linked enzyme. And then, whatever, depending on how much you have antigen in your sample, uh, they will both compete for interaction with the antibody. The other format that you have is you get the haptin, again, a different type of carrier protein, and then that you will immobilize on your hydrophobic surface and then in this case, you get an antibody that is labeled with the enzyme. And it's not just labeled with the enzyme, it would be also um, linked to the antigen in the sample. Okay, so what happens here is that you will have an antibody linked to an antigen similar to what you have in the sample linked with an enzyme and you have the antigen from your sample, from your actual sample. So this and that will compete to uh, binding to the antigen here. I think I confused you. I'm just going to restate the whole thing again. Okay, it's Friday. All right, so you have the antigen that you are using as a haptin and you have antigen in your sample. You have antibodies linked to enzyme. So these antibodies linked to the enzyme, they will either bind to the antigen in your sample and be washed off, or they're going to uh, bind to the antigen that is on your haptics. 
if they bound to the antigen on the haptin, that means you don't have a lot of antigen that are free from your sample. And then you have more color. Is this more clear? If you like me to repeat, I can, but hopefully this time around was clearer. Okay. So here's an example where aflatoxin detection is being done using uh, the antibody model. So you have your antigen linked to the uh, haptin and an enzyme, and you have your aflatoxin free. So if you have minimal absorp absorption, that means you have more aflatoxin in your sample. If you don't have any aflatoxin in the sample, all possible sites get bound, and you have high absorbance, and that means no toxin. Yeah. So if you were going for a tighter accuracy, why wouldn't you um, put your sample in, do a wash, and then do the... What do you mean tighter accuracy? Uh, so basically getting a more accurate depiction of the actual quantity of antigens in your sample. Yeah. Why would you put the sample in, allow it to react, wash, and then do your enzyme-bound antigen to then find the open sites left? instead of putting them both in at the same time? No, usually you actually put them stepwise, and I, missed, I didn't specifically say that. Every time you put a reagent, you put it in alone, and then you do a wash step, and then you put the next one in. But for simplicity of explanation, I did not walk through this. But earlier last time, um, on Wednesday, I did say every time you add a reagent, you have a wash step. Right, Chelsea? There's always a wash, wash step. Your washer keeps going up. At every time you add a, a different uh, reagent or component of your assay. There's always an in-between wash. Okay, so immunoreactivity is another chromatography we talked about uh, before. Uh, so immunoaffinity, I meant to say, you can separate uh, certain antigens uh, from a mixture or use antibodies to separate isolate purified type of protein out of a mixture or you can purify antibodies so if you have a mixture of antibodies and you just want to make sure that they're all monoclonal you can pass them through a column that has antigen in there as your stationary phase and then you can separate monoclonal antibodies that way so you can do purification of antibodies that way. You can do purification of proteins using antibodies as your leg ligand. And again, remember your chromatography, it's a very specific binding. And in order to have them elute, you have to change the ionic strengths, then you would change the um, electrostatic interaction. And also, if you change uh, the pH, you also can change the way they are interacting by changing the, st the charge. And then you can use them that way. Lateral flow strips. So this is a fast, uh, quick quality check, a, a field test we call it, especially if you're on the field, you want to determine presence of GMOs. So you would do a lateral uh, flow strip instead of running an elaborate um, lab experiment. So a common example that's not related to food is the pregnancy test, <laughs> which some of you might be doing at some point in life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and the yellow color here is coincidental. <laughs> that, but <laughs> anyway, on the strip, Delayed response to the yellow. <laughs> okay, so what you have on the strip, you have two important zones on your strip. The, the first one is you have a bunch of antibodies that have been labeled with a color compound. But they are not immobilized. They are just there on a part of the, the strip that is not immobilized, so they can move, basically. And then you have here, um, the capture antibody, the same 
type of mm -hmm. antibody or antibodies to the same antigen that you are trying to detect. So, but these, in this case, are immobilized. So these are immobilized, so they don't move, and these are not immobilized. So it's basically based on the principle of sandwich ELISA. So when you immerse your strip in your sample, a sample if, it, if the sample contains the antigen, the antigen is going to bind to the first set of antibodies that have been labeled with a color. And since they are not fixed, they're not immobilized, they're going to move up the strip by lateral flow, hence the name lateral flow strips. So they're going to move up and get to the next antibody that will fix them there, and then you will see a color developed at a certain location on your strip, and it will be positive. So here's um, a positive strip and a negative strip. You always have a control line to, to see if the experiment worked. If you don't see a color at the control line, that means the experiment did not work. So you have the test line and the control line. On the test line, you have a specific antibody for the antigen fixed. At the control line, you have an antibody to the antibody that has been used here. So you have the antibody here. At the control line, you have an antibody for that antibody. So that antibody that has been labeled with a color, if your sample is negative, it's just going to move up and then get captured by its antibody, and then the color will show, show up here. In any case, the color will always show up at the control line, because you, your antibodies are going to continue to flow. If you have an antigen, it will be captured by a second antibody here at the test line that has been immobilized to recognize that antigen. Then you would have another <coughs> line here. So you always have a two, two different lines, one for control and one for your test. And these are the different names. So the colored bead conjugated capture antibody. You have the detection antibody in the test line. You have your analyte, and then you have the antibody to the antibody. So it always, if, if you see in an exam a figure and I tell you to label it, you, want, you need to know what these things are. Okay, so it is based on Sanchelizer, and it's a field test, like I said, a very quick, rapid uh, test. Ah, Western blot. So, Western blot is another form of ELISA, or, well, it's immunoassay, based on antigen and antibody interaction. But in this case, it's more qualitative and a lot of screening. You can do a screening of a lot of different uh, proteins in a mixture and figure out which one of these proteins are reactive. So you can separate them and then detect which one of those is the antigen. So basically, you run a 2D gel. We talked about 2D gel in the protein characterization um, chapter. Do you remember on which two dimensions you separate when you use 2D gel? So you have an isoelectric focusing strip. You separate based on the isoelectric point, and then you put it on top of a regular SDS gel, and then you separate based on size. So you have two dimension separation. So you end up with a gel with a lot of spots on it. Oh, we should have taken a picture of your gel. Can I have yeah. pictures? Yeah, next year. Next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's actually what Chelsea's doing. He's been doing it for a few months now, trying to get it to work, and finally it worked. So you get a lot of different spots, but you don't know which one is your, the one that will react with your antibody if you're searching for a particular protein. So what you do is you want to transfer whatever is on the SDS gel to a hydrophobic surface where you can incubate with the different reagents. You cannot do that on the matrix of the gel, so you have to transfer. So here, 
is the apparatus we use. It's similar to an electrophoresis apparatus, but in this case, instead of loading, I'll take this off, instead of loading your liquid samples into wells, you have your gel. I suppose I can get this straight. Okay, so you have, are these the uh, f uh, filters or are these the membrane? That's the membrane. That's the membrane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a polyvinylidene a difluoride membrane. It's a hydrophobic surface membrane, basically. So what you would do is you will, um, <coughs> let's see if I remember this correctly. You would put a spawn and then you put the membrane, and then you have your piece of gel, which you have to be very careful at, not to break it, very gently put it on top of your membrane, and then you put another piece of sponge over it, and then you put it in this compartment here. You sandwich it, basically. Make sure it's snug and fit. Well, so you have now, in there you have your gel and then you have your membrane and you want to make sure you put it in the right position. For the life of me, I always forget which is positive and which is negative, but um, you want to make sure that you put it in the right direction where the, the electrons are moving. You need to make sure you have the gel at that side because you want the protein to move from the gel onto your membrane. So they will move with the current because they will be negatively charged. So you want to make sure they're on the right side for transfer. If they are on the wrong side of the transfer, nothing will be transferred onto your membrane. So that's one thing you want to remember, is you want to make sure that you put it in the right side. And then you put it in, in here and you add your running buffer. And then you plug it for voltage, for uh, to run a current, black on black, red on red in the right way, I'm not going to do it. But anyway, and then you run a current, and then after that, everything, all your protein, after a particular period of time, will transfer onto that membrane. So now you have the right medium for you to incubate to the different reagents. Like I said, you cannot do that on the gel itself, so you have to transfer it to a membrane where you can do that. Okay? So, what's the step that we talked about last time that you have to do before putting in any antibodies. You transferred, you have your proteins are on the hydrophobic surface of the membrane. What do you need to do? Do I have it here? Ah, oh, it's written, block. Okay, so you have to block every possible site on your membrane with another um, inert protein that will not react. You know that it will not react with your antibody. Oftentimes, bovine serum albumin, you can use gelatin as well. It depends on the experiment. But then this means you won't have nonspecific binding. If you don't do blocking, you might have antibodies nonspecifically binding to the, to the membrane. So you want to make sure you have a blocking <coughs> step, a wash step, before you incubate with your um, sample of antibodies. And oftentimes, your sample of antibody is serum. Like in the case of Kelsey, <coughs> she gets human serum with antibodies specific to soy protein. So serum gets diluted to a certain concentration so that you can have uh, good reading. And the serum get in, and the um, membrane get incubated with that serum. And then your antibody reacts with a particular antigen. At this case, you add an antibody to the antibody that is labeled. Hmm, is this direct or indirect ELISA? Indirect ELISA. So here it's an indirect ELISA because you have an antibody to the antibody and the antibody is the one that is labeled. You do a wash step and put a substrate, you get a color, and you'll find your protein that generated a color on your membrane. Okay, so that's Western blood. Here's, yeah? 
Okay, so can, I want to go back from way to the beginning of that. You're putting a bunch of proteins on that gel. Yes. And so the objective of that is to figure out what's going to react to your... So here's an example. So here's a gel with a bunch of protein from different sources, and you want to identify which of these are present. Which of these, for example, in this example, you want to find out if you have pork meat in there, pork protein. So only the pork protein is going to interact with the antibody, and that's the only one that you will see when you develop your film. Nothing else on the gel will be seen when the antibody is incubated with the whole bunch of proteins that you have there. Okay. So this is an SDS gel, this is an immune blot. It's a blot. So all you can see is the one that reacts with your antibody. Okay. And that's how one way that they would discover, for example, horse meat in a beef patty. They will extract the protein, run it on a gel, incubate with antibody for specific for horse protein, and they will find it. Okay, any questions? Yes? Um, so what are some other ways to detect allergens? So you have Western blots, you have ELISA, and pretty much these are the methods. You can do, of course you can do HPLC and MS and all the fun stuff with um, detection, but these are the ones commonly used to detect an allergen. Yeah, but there are all, so there are chromatography and MS methods, but they are not very um, user friendly in terms of expense and amount of time that you need to do to prepare your sample. Okay, we have some time to start a new topic. Hooray! This is a very important topic in industry, which is important for uh, producer, producers as well as consumers. It's a very, very sensitive topic, and um, there are a lot of food contaminants. You can't even imagine. A long list of it, and each one of them is different in characteristics and different on, in impact. So. This is the chapter 18 in your current book, but it's going in the new edition. It will be chapter 33, and it's um, a little bit edited to make it more current. So I edited the slides here. You will find the recent slides actually on Moodle week 15. I uploaded the uh, mostly they're the same, but there are few that I pulled from the new chapter especially tables and a couple more um, contaminants that were added to the chapter. Bye. Take out the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's always Jeshu, isn't it? <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> okay. So the food goes through um, different series of steps between the farm all the way to the consumers. So in the farm, you have the produce and you have the animals. And from there, they get transported into industry. Industry can produce ingredients, and industry can produce the products using the ingredients. And from there, they go to retailers. And from retailers, they go to consumers. So there are so many different steps. And in each step, there's a whole series of contamination that can happen. Let's try to list a few. From here, from looking at there, what kind of contamination can happen and at which step during the chain? How about feces from animals at the beginning? 
extraneous matter. That's next chapter. It's not going to be covered here. Antibiotics yeah, residue from animals. Perfect. Allergens or not? Allergens, when you are working in a plant and you have multiple ingredients being processed, you might get allergens. Yes, what else? At the farm level, what else? Pesticides. Pesticides, excellent. Also at the farm level, what else? What can you do to the crop? Or, yeah? What's that? Like toxins? Like microtoxins? Like what toxins? Microtoxins. Microtoxins, aflatoxins, yes. What? Heavy metals. Heavy metal, yes, from soil and from water. Yes, but what I was thinking about is? Fertilizer. Yeah, didn't we say pesticides? Oh, pesticides, not fertilizers. Fertilizer usually, what do they fertilize with? Nitrogen and stuff? Yeah, no, that's not a problem. Um, there was one other thing I was thinking of, is G uh, GMOs. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, leaving away the farm, what other contamination can happen and where? Amanda. Cross-contamination of what would be dangerous, hazardous to us, concern to us. You can always have cross-contamination, but what would be of concern? Huh? Well, allergens is one, yes. Pathogens? We don't care about micro in this class. <laughs> but that's true, pathogens. Okay. Um, have you heard of melamine? Where, which step it would take place? Intentional fraudulence. Reprocessing? In the processing, yeah. So intentionally adding a substance to mimic a protein when you don't have a protein, but you want to get a final, certain content of protein in your final product. So you can do that, call it fraudulence. Okay, um, have you heard of, um, what do you use to cure meat? nitrites and nitrates. So there are limits for how much nitrites and nitrate you can have in your meat product, cure meat product. Um, what do we add sulfide for? Hmm? Wine. Yeah, to do what purpose? It's a preservative and in wine to stop the fermentation at a certain time. And also in other applications you avoid uh, browning and oxidation because sulfides are reducing agents. Um, what can, what is an example when you heat food to a high temperature, what is an example of a toxic matter that can, uh? Acrylamide. Acrylamide. Yes, aspergine interact, yeah, it's a kind of a Maillard uh, induced reaction that will result in acrylamide. Furans is another uh, product produced when uh, carbohydrates are heated at high temperatures. Um, there are packaging material, bisphenol A, you heard of that? It leaks out of plastic bottles and it has health impacts. Um, ink, you heard of the ink that leaked out of a package into the cereal product? So that happened a few years back, so yes, that's one. Um, there are many others that we'll cover in this class. So you have so many different types of contamination that can occur or residue like pesticides and uh, antibiotics are residues that could remain in the product. Another one would be like additives. A lot of people put things into different products to help either flow or whatever. And there's sometimes there's limits you can apply. Yes, additives. There's a long list that I'll show later which includes food additives, yes. So yeah, and then which, what government agency uh, not necessarily control, but set limits. FDA. FDA controls, enforces, following. What what agency actually set limits? EPA. Huh? Is it EPA? EPA. Did you say FDA? EPA. Ah, sorry, I heard FDA. Inf Environment Protection Agency. So EPA sets the limits, and FDA and USDA enforces it. Okay. 
So since there are so many different places in the food chain that contamination can happen and residues may remain in the food, a lot of hazards uh, have actually made it to the food and a lot of calls and reports have been reported. So between the year of 2003 and 2007, which is uh, the, mo the most recent report by the time they were edit edition of the book was published, there were over 12,000 cases of hazards reported in food. So they divided them into categories, and they found that some of them were mostly um, chemicals, so the highest component or percentage of the pie was chemical hazards. So under chemical, you have the pesticides, you have the antibiotics that would be used, you have sulfides, for example, heavy metal, they all form, go under the chemical calls. You have a mycotoxin, which is another big part of the chart. And of course, there's the microbiological, which we're not going to emphasize on here, but it's a, another one under hazards. And then there's a, a whole <coughs> slice on other that, would, uh, that keeps evolving and keeps increasing. And it contains um, fraud, like melamine, labeling, like the plastic and the ink, uh, biological hazards, like the poop and stuff. <laughs> Um, chemical hazards, so nitrites, nitrates, uh, sulfide, um, quality, not sure what they mean here, hygiene, also under extraneous matter, and defective packaging and other. So other can be really a lot of different other. So we will focus on a few, quite a few. Uh, categories, so we'll cover pesticides, mycotoxins, and drug residues, which have a governmental tolerance level by, set by EPA and enforced by FDA and USDA. There is the allergen category that is not necessarily uh, fits with these, but there are certainly concern about them, recalls about them, so they're there too. Um, and then a whole lot of chemical additives, such as adulteration, example, melamine, and food additives, and there is a long list. So this is an updated table. In your current chapter, you only have the first half of it. You have the pesticides, mycotoxin, and antibiotics. But in the new edition, you have added to the stable GMOs, allergens, sulfide, and nitrite. So this table actually gives a good summary of the different methods used for quantitation and semi-quantitation and qualitative analysis or screening method. So it's a good review table. So if you want to know, uh, to have a quick study guide for these different components, then that would be a good table to use. So if we look at the current table you have is table 18.1, and it just looks at pesticide, mycotoxin, and antibiotics. So under <coughs> pesticides, there are methods we call MRM, which is multi-residue uh, methods. That means you, in one method, you can detect several residues, several pesticides, but they will all belong to similar families. That means they have the same polarity characteristics, solubility, so that you can extract them together and quantify them together. A lot of the methods in pesticides are GC-based, but HPLC is emerging because new pesticides are mostly polar nowadays than nonpolar. In the past, they were mostly nonpolar, so a lot of the methods are GC-based. Um, when testing like a food ingredient, would most, most companies do quantitative and qualitative? Well, first, if they suspect anything, they do qualitative to screen as many samples as possible. And if the qualitative testing become, becomes positive, then they go back to get the limits so, so that they will see if they meet the limits or not. So the, every, the, if you have a lot of samples, you always start here because it's quicker, you give you an idea, and then from there, if results are positive, you do more quantification to see if you are above the limit or below the limit 
um, that is allowed. Okay, so, but like I said, many pesticides is emerging from being non-polar to polar, and new pesticides are coming out. So a lot of HPLC methods being developed for detection of these pesticides. Um, single uh, residue SRM, it means that the method has been developed from extraction all the way to quantification detection to detect one type only. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. Oops. Mycotoxins, mostly HPLC because it is um, mostly polar. Um, there are some GC methods if you do derivatization, and then capillary electrophoresis and immunoassays. Antibiotics, also mostly HPLC, and then you do have GC and immunoassay. And then you have several screening methods for all of them. So we'll talk about each one of these individually. But we have two minutes remaining, and I won't finish this in two minutes, so I'll stop here. Everybody's happy, we'll stop and continue on Monday. For the Monday lab, we have a review session, so come to lab as normal. Please try to solve, study, and try to solve the practice problems you'll find on Moodle. It will not be, listen, it will not be an effective review session if you come not prepared. Okay, if you want to benefit from it, please try to get prepared for it. Okay.